Praise the Lord. We are on the Mind of Christ Series 3. And uh, this time we are looking at the Mind of Christ Series 1 was the introduction. Mind of Christ Series 2 was study the Greek words in the New Testament. Mind of Christ 3, we are looking at the Hebrew words. Uh, they have been translated the word mind. So let's go to God in prayer even as we consider His word. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. And your Holy Spirit is here, touching, feeling, upon and within each one of us. And as we come into your presence, we thank you, Lord, that you are conscious of all of us in every way, spirit, soul, and body. And we desire after you, Lord, we desire that we may know you even more. That we may tap into this avenue of the mind of Christ, the mind of God Almighty Himself. Of course, Lord, we recognize we cannot understand all of you. Oh, Father, we will never claim to do so, never ever be, because we know we are finite creatures. And only when we depart or we replace this body of flesh, can we get to know you even more? But right now, Lord, in our limited way, grant through your spirit of wisdom and revelation that we may understand as much as is possible to know of your spirit and of your heart. That we may grow in you, that we may know you in all your fullness. Thank you, Father, for your spirit. Thank you, Father all that you are doing, all that you are about to do, all that you always do. We confirm your word always with signs following. And we may grow in you, we may know you, and that Father, we will be established in you. Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit. We give you all glory, all praise, all and our honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. As you look at the Mind of Christ series 3, um, let me uh, just show first with a comparative chart. Uh, and it's a different chart than the one we showed the last week. But we have um, all the five Hebrew words for mind. And uh, then we also have two other words which are important. One is the word remember, which is the process of the mind. And the word uh, to know which is a process of uh, that. And so here we have, looking just at this section, we have uh, uh, all the possible Hebrew words that have been translated uh, mine, especially in this section here. And I have a, a printed out for me here about, um, from based on the Old King James, because it's only the Old King James that relates to uh, the Young's Concordance and the uh, uh, Strong's uh, 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 word studies, and uh, so it's a number besides those words. Most of modern translations do not have that. There are uh, 38 verses, and only 38. The whole, the whole Bible in the Old Testament, in the Old King James, quite similar in the New King James, has only 38 verses which cover the word my in the Hebrew. Of the 38 verses, most of the word my comes from the word soul which is the word nafesh. Nafesh. And uh, you don't have to turn to your Bible, I'm just introducing the subject first. Uh, like uh, Genesis 23, 8, when it says, He commune with them, saying, If it be in your nafesh or mind that I should bury my dead. So, it's like in your soul. And uh, remember, they don't speak English in the Bible time. They would speak... Uh, uh, Hebrew or the ancient languages uh, that they use. And if they had used the word nafesh, when they say, is it in your nafesh to do this? Uh, to the hearer, they will understand it is, uh, he's asking whether my soul feels that way. See, they don't have the English meaning of the word mind. So only when we translate into English, the word mind is put there. But uh, when they're speaking, they are referring to their soul thinking or their spirit thinking. And uh, another word, uh, I won't look at all 38 verses, but uh, for example, 
uh, when it says uh, in the, one of the curse of the law in Deuteronomy 38, 28 verse 65, among those nations shall thou find no east, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee a trembling heart, failing eyes, sorrow of nefesh. Sounds like sorrow of the soul, but an uh, English translation put it sorrow of mind. And uh, then, and, and uh, at other places, uh, it used the word uh, heart. But one more word for the word soul. In First Chronicles 28, verse 9, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. Serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing nafesh. For the Lord searcher all hearts and understand all the imaginations of the thoughts. So he's advising Solomon, seek God with all your mind. Translated, but they say nafesh. It could have been translated so. In fact, if all these verses that they have translated nafesh have been put the word soul, the meaning still will come true. But it's interesting that in the English they choose the word mind rather than soul. And then there are interesting ones like uh, Leviticus 24 verse 12 where they translate the word mind from the word pair, which is the normal word for mouth. Uh, in Hebrew, it says, uh, and they put him in inward, and that the mouth or mind of the Lord might be shown to them. And I checked some of the modern translations, they didn't translate in mouth either. Even though the original word is mouth, New King James still put mind, say my own King James, not the modern translation, they put the word mind, that they might know the mind of the Lord. Because they find it very funny to put the word mouth of the Lord, know what mouth of the Lord. But that tells you something the Hebrew approach to understanding the mind that uh, there are different parts of our mind and uh, not just the intellectual analytical mind that we all know so well and uh, then there are other places where like uh, Genesis 26 verse 35 where, where Esau took on a wife uh, of the Canaanite and they were a grief of Ruah to Isaac and to Rebekah Ruah we all know is a Hebrew word for spirit so grief of spirit to uh, Isaac and uh, other places where the word uh, Ruah are also used uh, like in Ezekiel 11 verse 5 the spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me speak thus saith the Lord thus have ye said O house of Israel for I know the things that have come into your Ruah your spirit so the things that came into their spirit so apparently they use the word spirit like the word mind, the normal word mind, and uh, then nafesh, which is the soul. Heart is used uh, very frequently. And uh, apparently the Hebrew are more interested in what your heart say than what your mind say. What your heart is thinking than what your intellect is thinking. And uh, uh, many times the word, uh, the most common words are the word lab followed by the word nafesh. Lab or lebat in a fool is from the uh, Hebrew word for heart. And uh, so talking about uh, what their heart is thinking uh, all the time. In David said to Solomon in First Chronicle 22 verse 7, My son is for me. It was in my mind to build a house under the name of the Lord my God. Here is in my heart lap. So when they talk about their mind, they refer to their spirit, their soul, their mind, or their heart. And very few times, in fact, if these are the only 38 times in the English translated as mine, if I had translated every single word here in its original, Ruah as spirit, Nefesh as soul, and uh, Lab as heart, and uh, I would actually be left with no words for mine. See, so one, the, the Hebrew people don't focus so much on the intellectual mind and the Greek. It seems that they focus on their spirit, their spirit and their, their soul, or different parts of their, their inner being rather than like the, the, the Greek uh, focus on the dianoia, the dialogismos, or your news, uh, different parts of your mind. And, uh, uh, so if I remove, translate all those, there's no more word for mind. You might have a word for thought, a word for remember, and uh, then uh, you would have, uh, I think it's uh, a word for no, one more word down there. Yeah, you can move it slightly down. One more word down there. The word for no that is inside. Yes, that's it. Yeah. So there's a raw, 
to know. So there's all these uh, different words there. That now, how does all this uh, benefit us? Uh, how does it apply in our Christian life? Is our question. And uh, we have thirty-nine books of the Old Testament, twenty-seven in the in the New. The Old Testament understanding of the word mind is it's not so much what the intellectual mind is thinking. It's more interested is what's going on deep in your soul, deep in your spirit, and deep in your heart. And as I examine to understand all these different avenues of the of the way thoughts are processed, all these can produce thoughts, which means that in the Old Testament, you could have a thought thoughts that come to you from your soul, spirit, from your soul, from your heart, from your imagination, from your mouth. Now this mouth one is interesting, which means that to the Hebrew, when they are saying something, there's a different part of their mind involved that they're recognizing. And you know how in the old Chinese uh, method and uh, in the classical way, you get people to learn something, you make them memorize by rote. So every time they're repeating it, and they're saying it over and over again, saying it over and over again. And remember how, you know, uh, when you do something wrong, the teacher makes you write a thousand lines. Find a line. I shall not do this, I shall not do that. All this. And, and you're saying it. It's meaningless to you. I mean, the meaning might be either one sentence simple, but you're saying it over and over again. Apparently, to the Hebrew, they understand it engaged a different part of their mind. Not their conscious thought, but another part, deeper maybe part of their mind that is being engaged. And so they recognize that the word mouth is directly related to the mind. And same with the word uh, 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 zakeh, which is uh, the word remember, some of these Hebrew words, thoughts that can come from all the different aspects uh, of, of, of their life. Now, as we grow in our Christian life, we realize that we need to uh, deal with all these uh, different dimensions and uh, I like to relate that to what I call uh, our actual understanding, our modern understanding in, of the word mind, how we relate it back to the Bible understanding. So for a moment, we look at a different section and uh, we look under a little uh, section I have for brain and uh, a little section on the brain here and uh, we get the picture up to you soon in a while. And uh, so, uh, while we are getting that uh, together, if you have your Bible, if you have your Bible, um, turn with me in your Bible to First Corinthians chapter two. The reason we are teaching this series is so that we all can learn how to access deep within us the mind of Christ. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, uh, verse uh, 12 and verse 16. I read from, let's read from verse uh, 10 onwards. It says, God has revealed them to us, that is the things that God has prepared for us. So the word things in verse 10, refer, uh, refer uh, reveal them to us. What is the them? Uh, those are referring to verse 9. Things that eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. So God has a lot of things for those who love Him. And He says in verse 10, He reveals them to us. But apparently what He revealed to us, our mind doesn't know yet. Only our spirit. For verse 11, what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Only our spirit knows the things that God has revealed. Now how is our spirit going to communicate to us? Through verse 13, sharing to us things not with man's wisdom, not with the normal intellect, which the Holy Spirit teaches, compares spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14, the natural man. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. But he who is spiritual judges all things. And verse 16, Who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. 
So apparently, we do possess the mind of Christ within us. So some of us say, if I have the mind of Christ, how come I'm not smarter? If I have the mind of Christ, how come I don't know a lot of solutions? If I have the mind of Christ, how come I cannot do a lot of things? Because we're not tapping on the mind of Christ. That's the trouble. And perhaps we have not been taught how to tap on the mind of Christ. Because this mind of Christ that we have, that is within us, cannot, let me show what it cannot be done. Already it said in verse 14, the natural man cannot access it. Then you have in verse 14, the natural man cannot receive. So everything in our natural cannot tap on that. And uh, all that they try to do, you know, by mind, mind power, willpower, cannot tap on this natural, cannot tap on the spiritual man. You can at most tap on your natural man. And then there's these other words in the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And it tells us in Romans 8 that uh, in verse uh, 5 and 6, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. Set what? Set which part of them? Their minds. Verse 6. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. So the next question I ask you, do you have life and peace? If you don't have means you're setting your mind wrongly. Because the Bible says, if you set your mind to spiritual things, life and peace is death. So obviously if you cannot experience divine life and peace, the setting is wrong. You set it wrongly, it produces death. You set it correctly, it produces life and peace. But there's another thing in verse 7, which is similar to 1 Corinthians 2. Remember 1 Corinthians 2, what we cannot do, natural mind cannot access. Here it says, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, No, indeed can be. In other words, give it up. The Bible says it cannot, it cannot be subject to God, nor will it ever be. Do you notice the words there? The last phrase said, no indeed can be. That means it never, it will never be subdued to the things of the Spirit. And most all you can do is put it to the side and let it be renewed. And uh, slowly renewing with a new way, I think it cannot be subject. You need to become the new mind. So your conscious mind become an observer of the process that is going forward. Which in our first service today, we were talking about the empowered Christian life. The empowered life is a life based on tapping upon your spirit consciousness. Which is deep in your subconscious. Which means that every day when you make a decision and every day in every important situation in life, you don't just think, you don't just analyze, you don't just theorize and search out the facts and data. All those things you can do. But the most important thing is, what is your subconscious mind doing? What is happening in your subconscious? If you want to live a powerful Christian life, hour to hour, time to time, you must sense what's going on in your subconscious. And be aware of what's going on in your subconscious so that you make the right decisions. So that you tap on the right flow. So that the, the spirit of man that is within you, that knows everything about you, and your life can guide you in the right path. So the secret is to tap upon that subconscious, but I don't use, use the word subconscious because it's misunderstood to be uh, new age and uh, just a subconscious mind. And, uh, and subconscious mind alone by itself can include the soul or yourself, inner self. But that's more than that. It's your spirit that we want to partake of. Your, your inner man, your spirit man. So I use the word, your spirit subconscious, which is deep on your inside. And the thing about tapping upon your spirit subconscious is, how do you tap upon that? Natural mind cannot tap upon it. The carnal mind is enmity against it. By enmity, it means it's directly contradicted. So what can we do? One has to be put aside first. 
So temporarily to tap upon your subconscious spirit, you have to put aside your mind first. And the part of your mind you have to put, part, put aside is the part that Matthew 6, 33 tells you, the part that worry, things. Do not worry. That's the part of your mind to go. That part must be taken, put on the shelf, or put in a place, put in some place. And then you tap upon that super subconscious part of your mind, which is in your spirit, and is coming forth from you. But the problem is, how do you communicate with your subconscious spirit? Now, if you say, oh, I try to make it conscious. Cannot. If you're conscious, then no more subconscious. <laughs> if, 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 you, if, you, if you can make it conscious, then no more subconscious. Hello? Are you there? <laughs> Obviously, it remains in your subconscious. Okay, subconscious, how do you communicate? Some people communicate when they sleep. <laughs> it's subconscious. And then, uh, like I say, in, uh, in Job chapter 33, then the Lord revealed to you in the dreams and all that. But how do you contact that part of your being? It operates on a different level. And let me give you a few things that the subconscious deals with. The subconscious deals with pictures. The subconscious deals with sounds. That's deep within you. Subconscious deals with music. So hey, there's an avenue to communicate. Not that we necessarily believe that an alien will land on Earth, uh, which God uh, undoubtedly will not permit since the dispensation of mankind is not finished yet. But uh, if, hypothetically speaking, an alien were to land, how are you going to communicate? Sign language! But let's say the alien doesn't know anything about hands. <laughs> How do you communicate? Obviously, you know, if you watch some of the alien movies and people try to communicate with alien, remember that uh, little Steven Spielberg story. Oh, what was there a story before that? Yeah, yeah whichever uh, story that was, uh, not E.T., but there was another one, uh, uh, something about the third one. Encounters of the third kind, yeah, that's the one. And uh, they try to use mathematics. Pi, 3.142, and all, all these are sounds, lights, music. See that? Now, our attempt in our conscious mind to remain in contact with our subconscious sometimes is reduced to that level. But it's more than that. And that level is only at a natural level. There's more than that. And how to be able to tap upon the spirit part of our being. And to understand that to the Hebrew, that there is a dimension of the mind that can be tapped upon. This ruach, deep within the spirit of your mind. And it's also in your Bible, by the way. In the book of uh, Ephesians, chapter 3, in chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 3, it says here, in verse 16, Paul praying for the Ephesians, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might. The word strengthened is dunamis, with might through his spirit in the inner man. See, there's an inner man, the spirit man that knows all things. Uh, Peter calls it the hidden man of the heart. That Christ may dwell in your heart through faith that you may you you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints why the width, length, depth, and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Verse 19 is interesting. You know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. It's beyond language. You that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. So there's a power that works in us, which is the Holy Spirit, in our inner man, that is greater and more exceeding, much more exceeding greater than what you ask or what you think. Beyond your natural man. That's the part that God wants to bring us to. And in chapter 4, verse 23, 
He says in, he do two things. Verse 22, to put off your old man. Now your old man is your, is your old mind, your carnal mind, which cannot be subjected to God. It has to be crucified on the cross. The old man must be put off in verse 22. Verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, the expression in the English, spirit of your mind, imply there's a part of your mind that's in your spirit. And that's the spirit, be renewed in the spirit part of your mind. Or, he's trying to tell them to spiritualize their mind. But uh, here, he uses the word pneuma, the Greek word for spirit. Spirit of your mind. That means your mind expands through your spirit, soul and body. And then there's the spirit part of your mind that you have to tap on. When, when I say, you know, uh, let's go to uh, the lounge room of your house. So it's your lounge room is part of your house. And uh, if I were to say, you know, let's look at the emotions of your soul. Your emotions were part of your soul. Let's look at, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So obviously there's a part of your mind that contacts the spirit realm. That's the part of your mind that will renew you. There's a key to renewal. The spirit of your mind. And... Uh, Verse 24 confirms it. That you put on. See, when the spirit of your mind dominates you, you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true holiness. And to simplify, instead of looking at all the seven things there, you could simplify it to an area of spirit, soul, and body. Now, within each part is a compartment, compartment spirit, soul, and body. So there's a spirit part of your mind, there's a soul part of your mind, and there is a natural part, biological part of your mind. And so we just temporarily want to understand the biological part, which is our brain. And even our brain is so complex. It's so complex, and let's look at some of the things that the brain does. And uh, uh, your, when your brain uh, does something, uh, for example, uh, a tennis player, when they, when they want to hit a stroke, they do not depend on their conscious mind. They depend on their subconscious mind. And here in the article of uh, Newsweek, uh, 10 July 2011, not too long ago, they talk about winning and the psychology of winning and the biology of winning. What's going on? It says, the movements of an elite athlete are beautiful to watch. But what goes inside their head? The best players learn their moves by encoding whole ex sequences in their cerebellum, which is part of their brain, uh, through intensive practice. And then in game situations, activate them without conscious thought. To return a serve, for instance, a tennis player uses the telemass to focus on the opponent, while the prefrontal cortex quashes distraction, remove all distraction, Visual information that comes from the back, the occipital lobe, activates the unconscious motor program in the basal ganglia, which passes instruction to the posterior parietal cortex, which calls up the automatic movement and the premotor cortex to, in staging ground for complex movement. The premotor transmits commands to the motor cortex, which orders muscle movement, swing. Wow, so many things, zoom, 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 and then you sleep. Obviously, you cannot be thinking about that. You're thinking about those things, finish. Thank God that some of our biological movements are auto automatic. Imagine if you and I control our own heart. Then you're tired, you forgot to tell your heart to beat. <laughs> or you control your own breathing. You forgot to tell your lungs to breathe. You're all dead long ago. <laughs> So we can't, so some parts are put on the automatic system and uh, so we just want to consider different parts of our, our, our biological brain and we're going to relate that to spirit, soul and body. And let's look at uh, these uh, different various main parts. There are four main lobes of course. You have your frontal lobe and the frontal lobe apparently 
uh, is concerned with your emotions, reasoning, planning, movement, parts of speech. It's also involved in purposeful acts such as creativity, judgment, problem solving, and planning. So all these things, plus the frontal cortex, uh, cerebral cortex. <laughs> So all these things, you know, your planning, your judgment. So sometimes when you're all trying thinking, 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 you're studying, studying, analyzing, you notice that a lot of your brain, uh, you could sense, if you're actually conscious, some of you might be conscious of, of different parts of your brain. Uh, not all of us are, but some of us. So you might, you could feel yourself go thinking, <laughs> like, like the forward part of your brain is actually, actually happening. The activity is in your forward side. Of course, if you put you under an MRI, you could see the activity there going on. Uh, your brain is activated, there's electricity flowing and uh, so you can actually see, realize which part of your brain is functioning and then there is the, the uh, portion there at the back but on top called the parietal lobe and that's the part that got, say, the tennis player got it involved the parietal lobes are found behind the frontal lobes above the temporal lobes at the top back of the brain, see here is it and remember there are two sides, this is only the left side, that's the other side, both equal and uh, they are connected with the processing of nerve impulses related to the senses. So a tennis player, of course, he got to all your senses goes to that section. All you, all that you hear, all that you sense, all that you smell, all the senses goes there and is processed there. And touch, pain, taste, pressure, temperature, they also have language function. So all this goes into here to be processed. And as it's processed, your reaction has, has to be there. And uh, so, uh, some of you feel, oh, I'm in pain. So sometimes when you feel, you know, pain and all that, you feel the back part of your brain, you feel it, uh, like some sort of pressure. So a lot of people, their headaches, although their headaches is here, they feel like something gripped them around the head. And uh, that's uh, all those uh, things happening, maybe a pain beyond what you can bear, and all the signals keep going in there. And uh, so something is, obviously being processed or uh, overloaded in that area. You have the temporal lobe and that's at the bottom part here, this bottom part, but, and it says uh, uh, temporal lobes are responsible for hearing, memory, meaning and language. They also have a role in emotion and learning. The temporal lobes are concerned with interpreting and processing auditory stimuli. So, at the side, of course, your hearing uh, is part of it that goes in. But it is also processing a lot of uh, your ability to recognize objects. And uh, so it's processing all this information uh, at the side that is there. Notice that so far in all the three, uh, they have to do with uh, emotions also. So your emotions seem to be spread out all over the brain. And then the last one, the occipital lobe, which is the back. It controls your visual, all your visual. So your Im imagination, I guess, will be uh, stirring on this part. Occipital lobe is involved with the brain's ability to recognize objects. It's responsible for our vision. So that your eyes are in front, the signals go all the way to the back. Your occipital lobe, that is there. And gets all uh, the signals uh, of your visual brain. Then there are other small, smaller parts of the brain, the brain and they go right down to uh, all the other parts. Okay, the cerebral cortex, which I mentioned, right in the front. And uh, in higher mammals, this cortex looks like it has lots of wrinkles, grows, and the cortex is letting work for a part. And uh, in, in the front part of the brain, the cerebral cortex is more developed in higher animals. In the lower animals, it's not there. And uh, it, um, between a, a young teenager, and uh, adult, the young teenager is not developed yet. Apparently, part of the maturing process caused them to develop the cerebral cortex. The cerebellum that we saw in the tennis player, uh, it is cauliflower shaped, located in the lower part. So you like cauliflower, eat more, might be good for your cerebellum. <laughs> you know, the Chinese are very funny. They want you to be smart, they eat pig's brain, monkey brain. Make you smarter. I don't know whether they make you think like a pig and monkey better or whatever. <laughs> but it's strange. Uh, cauliflower shape. Who knows? Cauliflowers might be good for you. And uh, anyway, we know all the vegetables are good for us. Uh, the cerebellum controls your movement, balance, posture, coordination. Uh, new research has also linked it to thinking, novelty, and emotions too. 
And uh, the cere word cerebellum comes from Latin, little brain. And uh, then we have the another part called the hypothalamus. Uh, it's part of the limbic system. And uh, it is located in the internal portion of the brain under the thalamus. The hypothalamus controls your body temperature, very important. Emotions, hunger, thirst, appetite, digestion, and sleep. So when some of you feel sleepy or you are sleeping now, then your <laughs> hypothalamus has just told you, no, go, go to sleep. And uh, so, and you feel hunger, thirsty, that's the part of your brain that right now being affected. And uh, it's composed of several areas located in the base of the brain. It's only the size of a pea. One, three hundred of the total brain weight. But it's responsible for a lot of things when you look down there. Uh, it's responsible for some very important behaviors. Uh, it could control you. You know how some people, when they lack sleep, they like that, all those parts are affected. And uh, then, of course, you have your thalamus, and uh, uh, there is that controls your sensory integration and motor integration. Uh, here, discuss it a little bit. It, uh, the cerebral cortex also sends information to the thalamus, which they transmit the information to other parts of the brain and the brain stem. Very important. Apparently, uh, if any part of your brain gets affected, you know, you might survive. But if your brain stem is affected, you die because it controls your automatic heartbeat and your lungs and all those things cannot function. You die. Pituitary gland is part of the limbic system, although it hangs below the rest of the limbic system. Now, I just cover it for now because it's important to part of what we're going to understand afterwards. Pituitary gland controls your hormones. It helps to turn food to energy. Without your pituitary gland, you could eat, but you wouldn't get any energy from the food. Wouldn't that be horrible? To eat and eat and nothing gets to you. So, uh, tiny little fellow, very important inside you. And uh, why we're looking at that's because afterwards we are also going to look at how Chinese medicine possibly work when you compare to Chinese and Western medicine. I believe I found a connection, and you can explain something. So that's why I give you all this pineal gland. The pineal gland is part of the limbic system, so it's located in the internal portion of it. Pineal gland controls your growing and maturing. Uh, so this part is funny, you didn't know that you're being activated by light. So if you were, you were born and live all your life in a place without a trace of light, your pineal gland would never start to work. So your pineal gland is the part that is deep inside your brain and is activated by light. So when light is there, then it's activated. Scientists have not fully understand everything about it. They only understand that when light is activated, uh, it tells you day and night. It tells you when to produce melatonin. The word gland means it produces some chemicals. And it's a part of the brain and it does at the same time produce some chemicals. And, uh, and so it's affected by light. Light and darkness. And uh, amygdala, very important part in your brain stem. Almond shape is part of the limbic system located in the internal portion of the brain. There are two of them control your emotions such as regulating when you're happy or sad. So right now, you are all the time controlled because why as a Christian, you have a sense of well-being. That sense of well-being, your amygdala is at work. A sense of fear, you feel fear, frightened, is all, all your emotions are found in this guy, amygdala. Your amygdala is very important. Without it, you could win the lottery and feel nothing. You wouldn't be happy. Or you could lose all your money and feel nothing. And uh, then the next day you will lose it all again. Apparently in a Time Magazine one time, they were analyzing a person. And that was an article about EQ, Emotional Quotient. You know, IQ is intel Intelligent Quotient. EQ has come to the fore now. EQ is Emotional Intelligent. And they found that people with their amygdala underdeveloped their EQ is very low. Those highly developed, they can feel emotion, they can also feel the emotions of other people. They can read people's emotions. And your EQ is highly at work. And so in the article about EQ uh, in the Time Magazine years and years ago, when they talked, when the amygdala was still very new, and, uh, and, they, and, and they were analyzing it, they found that 
a, a businessman who had an operation uh, for something and in his brain and his amygdala was damaged. And they found that he is a very intellectual, normal person and he keep making the same mistake over and over again. So say why? Because each time he made the mistake, he didn't feel the, the, the emotions of the wrong mistake. So thus, he keep making it again. Because somehow we are all motivated by feelings. The reason you don't do something bad is because it makes you feel bad. The reason why you enjoy doing something good is because it makes you feel good and happy. Tell me a hobby that you hate. No, you have a hobby because you love it. You do those things called hobbies or leisure things you like to do because you like to do them. And uh, we are motivated by that happiness thing. The emotions is affecting us without us knowing. The amygdala, very important. And you see where I classify it afterwards. Uh, hippocampus uh, stores your memories. This part is so important. If your hippocampus were, were, were destroyed, you completely lose your ability to learn. Which means that classrooms, books, no, no use anymore. Completely lose your ability. The hippocampus forms and stores memories. Scientists think that there are other things unknown. So remember, all this is, is what research has so far. Probably a few thousand things not, not researched yet. Your hippocampus is one of the most important parts of your brain. If you don't have it, you wouldn't be able to remember anything. And then we go lower down. And uh, people with Alzheimer's disease lose their functioning of their hippocampus. Cannot remember. Cannot, if you cannot remember, you cannot function. If I step into the door, I say, who are you? <laughs> who are you? You show me the Bible, I say, what is this? <laughs> Finish. Obviously, all your memory is gone. And it's all based on your hippocampus. And uh, then, midbrain. Your midbrain is an area located in the middle of the brain, behind the frontal lobes. Midbrain controls your breathing reflexes, your swallowing reflexes, all the very important function. The midbrain includes the thalamus, hippocampus, and amygdala. Every living thing has to have a midbrain uh, for normal function. So, okay, that we finish that part. We go back to the comparative chart now. Comparative chart. And uh, so in the comparative chart, I try to isolate which part of our brain. Remember, this is not a thorough picture, but it at least gives you some classification to know the different function parts of your brain, how it relates to one of the Hebrew words or an area in your spirit, soul, or heart, or body. And of course, the brain, there's no part that control, contains your spirit. You know, you should thank God so otherwise they can operate, take your spirit up, to put your spirit back. Or operate, put another spirit in you, so you got two spirits. No such thing, of course. So, you can cut the person out, you cannot find their spirit or their soul. Now, if you cannot find a soul, then why do I put a soul section? Because these are things that operate like close to your soul area. Because your soul is your feelings and your intellectual functions and all those things involved. And uh, so I put there your soul, uh, your cerebellum, your hypothalamus, your amygdala, uh, all this to do with your feelings and learning process. And link it up. I see to different parts of your the brain. Then of course your heart, the elements, the mid brain, the main function. Imagination, Yadza. Occipital lobe. The part that is visual. Seems to quicken yourself in the area. And uh, then you go to your mouth, your the parietal lobe, temporal lobe, not to do with your limbic function. Uh, remembering, of course, it's easy. Remembering your hippocampus, part of you. And then the knowing, uh, analyzing everything, I put at your cerebral cortex, frontal lobe. This is also a part of your soul, of course, but I separate it out into the knowing part, your analysis, your judgment, your self-awareness. Uh, that's functioning in this part. So you can imagine, even biologically, biologically, we 
I will need one section of us that is in the in the real consciousness. So if we go lower down here, it's like all these parts are subconscious, subconscious, because feelings deep inside you. And uh, then all these subconscious, this one, you know, you might say conscious, but you're not really subconscious. The images are affecting you. And uh, subconscious, subconscious. Then this part, part of it is conscious. Even in your biological brain, we are not sure all that is happening inside us. All you do is think a thought, and the thoughts happen. So many parts of our being are activated. And uh, the thing about this, remember our brain to me is just like a receiver transmitter thing. The thought happened outside of it. And so by constantly activating that part, it can change it. Yes, it can change it. Uh, long ago, scientists uh, uh, did an experiment, of course, poor monkeys. Uh, they did an experiment where they make the monkey keep using the what we have the thumb, monkeys got no thumb. So they make the monkey keep moving. For thousands and thousands and thousands of times every day, uh, the, the index uh, or, or the thumb. And so then at the end of it, they operate and see which part of the brain of the monkey got affected. The limbic system where the thumb was connected. And then if it's visual, the occipital low. So apparently, your usage or lack of usage is also causing it to, to grow or to be less. So we are affecting our brain sometimes. It's not that your brain affects you. Your, your, whatever you continue to do affects it back and causes it to be more or less, apparently. And some parts will be, when it's more well used, it's increasing even more powerfully. And that tells us something. The brain is more like a, a side effect that is visible on our side. And uh, then, uh, why do I go to the glandular system? I'll explain why. Because when I was looking at this Hebrew words, understanding the word mind and consciousness and meditation, the moment I study meditation, I want to look at what the what is understood by meditation outside of Christianity. And then compare to what the Bible says is meditation because remember what our solution is. What are we trying to do? We are seeking to help us to be quote unquote conscious of the subconscious mind. You cannot really make it conscious, but you sort of awareness of your subconscious. Since since we know that is inside our inner subconscious where the spirit dwells. Obviously, every decision we make, we must step on the inner consciousness. But to get into our inner consciousness, I realize it's by meditation. So there's Christian meditation that brings us into that, which I will talk about. But basically, what else is the world seeking to do outside? And when you talk about meditation, both Hinduism and Buddhism and, um, have their different views altogether. But in Hinduism and Buddhism, they had the, what I call the chakra system. You might heard of the seven chakra. Now remember, when I, when I mention that, it is not that I believe in that. Uh, I don't believe in that. But if we have the truth, which is the Bible, the truth should not be afraid to confront what we believe is an error. So if you have the truth, you don't say, oh, I, I don't know, no, no, I just look at the Bible. No, if you have the truth, you're willing to take other people's philosophy and compare to the Bible to see which part is right, which part is wrong. The, the truth is not afraid of confrontation, debate, or arguments. The truth is willing to look at it. So uh, being a Christian does not mean that we hide under the coconut shell and don't see and read the facts. Being a Christian, if you have the truth, you're willing to consider all the belief system of the whole world, all the belief system of every religion, all the belief system of New Age or occult, everything, and say, okay, tell me all that you understand, and let me compare with what the Bible says. That's what we are doing today. And so, for a moment, uh, just to show that we are very thorough in our examination and research, we don't just jump to conclusion. Uh, I have a thorough look at the chakra system of Hinduism and Buddhism. And so I have a little chart for you 
on uh, another chakra uh, system. And uh, I'll show you how, you see, for them when they meditate, the purpose of some of these religions and philosophies of New Age is they're trying to help people become a better person in their own way, correct? Nobody starts a religion in order you know, to do something bad. That's why, in my opinion, all religions you know, have some truth. I wouldn't say they have no truth, there's some truth. And uh, in their own way, they're trying to do some good. They're trying to uh, do some good in humanity. And uh, so in their own, they're trying to get help, or they're trying to get prosperous, they're trying to get success. That's what people believe religion for. They want something. That's why they go for it, or whatever belief system. And uh, this guy, I think, needs to put on more weight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This more one time do the video. <laughs> okay. So anyway, the chakra system of Hinduism and Buddhism has seven chakras called the crown chakra, third eye chakra, throat, heart, solar plexus, uh, sacral chakra, and basal chakra. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there are all the seven chakras that are there. And they believe in their meditation system. And uh, if you if any of you have had long ago been in New Age, had been in New Age, and you're presently still there, afterward we can pray for you. And uh, so, you know, to, to, to help you understand that you don't need to go to that route. And uh, Christianity does have an answer uh, to that. There's a way to get to God. There's a way to get to God. And of course, whatever people they are, they might be doing their best, they don't know Jesus yet. That's why Yoja and Maja is telling the truth. And, uh, but then, sometimes you, some Christians go tell them the truth, then they start bringing second chakra and say, hey, what chakra, chakra? You know, I only know how to talk about the and chakra. So, so we are become ignorant, uh, ignorant Christians, rather than no knowledge-based Christians who are able to discuss those things. So the next time after this, a uh, non-Christian say, oh, these are chakra. I say, oh yeah, I know about that. I say, wow, you know about it? Wow. I say, did your Bible say anything about it? Oh, yes, we did. And we compare it to the seven Hebrew words. Ah, yeah, wow, okay. And uh, anyway, uh, they believe in their meditation system. You know how when they meditate, they concentrate different parts of their body. And sometimes they concentrate on their breathing. And they concentrate on any one of the seven chakra. So they will be meditating and concentrate all their mind, power and consciousness all zoom to one chakra. And the chakra also operate by color. So they try to reach by color, or by meditation, or, or, or by, by conscious thought. And uh, as they meditate, they concentrate the color and the sounds. So they got sounds, color. And they, when you look at people using color, sounds, and all that, you notice what they're doing? They are trying to reach their subconscious mind. See, I analyze it from the scientific point of view. They are purely trying to tap on their subconscious something beyond that. So all these they're trying to tap on. Some of them might tap on their soul subconscious mind. They might have some benefit from it even. You know, we got to admit, uh, some of these people who do that, they might benefit better than some people who don't do that. And they might enter into higher level of health. In fact, some of these meditations have been tested by scientists and they found that there's an increase in chemicals, endorphins and all that. They brought some of the people to better health than they were before. And uh, some of these systems are popular because it did help some people, not that it did help. But it might not help all people. And, uh, but all these things that are there, of course some Christians when they see it, they say, Ah, demon, demon, can you see? Oh, demon, you see, become possessed. As if we Christians are so weak, you know? Then how are we going to study comparative religion? And, uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, they, I think there's a sort of, being a Christian doesn't mean that we have to be ignorant, uh, except that we need to be willing to look at what the Bible says in regards to that. Paul was not ignorant. Remember Paul, he even quoted some of the writings of the other philosophers. He did it when he wrote to Titus. He said one of their own Greek people say this, and he did it in the book of Acts chapter 17 when he confronted the Athen. He says, you know when Paul quoted, in him we live and move and have our being, do you know who said that? He said, oh, the Bible said it. Before the Bible said it, who said it? It's not in the Old Testament. Paul was quoting from the Greeks. So what? To quote means you're going to read first, correct? Oh, I better read that verse already. 
uh, Acts 17, when he was in Athens, I like that phrase. It's a very powerful phrase. And uh, Paul said here, in uh, Acts 17, he says to them, when he talk about uh, 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 God, and he tried to preach to them about God, and he says he made all men of one blood, uh, everything, and how that we all need to now come uh, to him. He commanded everyone uh, to come before him. So his sermon is found in verse 22. He says, Men and brethren, Acts 17, 22, Men and brethren, I perceive that all things are very religious. Now he was there studying all their things too. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with the inclusion to the unknown God. The one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God will make the world, everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth. Verse 25, he is worshipped without hands. And he needed, as though he needed anything, since he gives all life, breath and all things. And verse 26, he has made a one blood every nation. And uh, verse uh, uh, 27, 28, and he says here, verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own poets has said for we are also his offspring interesting is that he quote their own poets so Paul was not ignorant he was always willing to stand and have apologetics which is discuss the faith and defend the faith and he's not afraid so in this uh, seven chakra they try to concentrate on colors and they try to concentrate on different parts of their body to increase. And to them, the seven chakra must be in a progressive order. And sometimes one or two of the chakra might be out of sync. So they think that meditation, where all seven function nicely, then they got all the nice rainbow colors. See, all the colors are very nice. And so then they are in full health. An interesting philosophy. An interesting way of understanding. I mean, if you don't have Christ and you don't have the Bible, don't have anything, this is quite an interesting philosophy. And so it attracts some people. And uh, so, uh, it's, uh, although it's origin, it has all its origin, then we look lower down. Uh, okay, I think that's the maximum. The others didn't come up. Okay. And so basically, it's like the chakras are four centers, energy, and everything. So when I was uh, looking, comparing to the Bible, uh, I thought, uh, to me, it was an original uh, thought. As I analyzed it, I realized, hey, the chakras uh, seem to be in position area where it position in all the glands of the body. And remember, our body has a brain, but our body has glands. Right now, the glands of our body are keeping our whole body alive biologically. So I know the positions of them, and then I realized that they relate to different glands in our body. I thought it was an original thought because it was the first time that I had it. And then when I did my research, I realized there were three other people who also thought like that. And uh, two of them are Western authors. And uh, some of them wrote a book where they, they believe that this, because they are not religious, they are scientific like me. So they were looking and saying, okay, how do you explain these things in natural? And so I'm not the original person who says that, apparently. So uh, a few other people also are concluding that it relates to the gland system of the body. And you know the gland system of the body can be affected by... by... thoughts... and... feelings... and... pictures... and smells. Interesting, isn't it? That your body is being affected by that. I mean, you heard of aroma therapy. It's affecting your glandular system. Colors. All these are affecting us. And separately, I have a whole list of research on colors and the effect on the body. And you might have heard me describe it before. Where they have this uh, animal that they create the skin, uh, the, the fur of the skin, um, what animal? The mink coat. The, the animal that produced uh, the mink coat. And then they exposed this animal to light. They found 
that when this animal grow up and exposed only to uh, blue light, more males were born than females. A very, very high percentage. When the animals are exposed to just pink light, more girls were born. See that? Boys like blue, girls like pink. <laughs> Do you think that is that is accident? No. Something inbuilt in our DNA. Boys like blue, girls like pink. Red. Of course, I didn't say all of us like that. There are always exceptions. Right? Some boys like red, some girls like blue. And, uh, you know, but there is an inbuilt thing within us that we're not realizing. And so, now we put aside this chakra system. And then I bring forth to you the endocrine system. And endocrine system, yes. Uh, <clears throat> next one is the endocrine system. Uh, yeah, and the endocrine, plus the word endocrine is just a picture for. Okay, the endocrine is found in the pituitary gland, and uh, then of course you got another, uh, these are, there are more endocrines, that, more glands than this, but these are the glands that secrete directly into your bloodstream. That's why the pineal gland is not mentioned. Pituitary gland, parathyroid, you notice the positioning? It all looks like the seven chakra, doesn't it? So that was when I first started noticing it and then started studying the impact of each one the parathyroid, uh, thyroid, the thyroid gland, thymus, adrenaline, pancreas, ovaries and all these other glands. Now we go to the, uh, we close this and go to the endocrine system. And in the endocrine system, uh, we go look further very quickly and uh, we won't spend too much time here. I just want to show you that hey, all the endocrine glands and here it tells you what is secrete. There are chemicals being secreted by your body. There is oxytocin, uh, semotostatin, and all these hormones and different things being secreted from different glands. And the thyroid, your pineal gland, your pituitary gland, hypothalamus. And then we go further down. Uh, so some more glands. We go to the where the pictures are. These are all the, the, the type of hormones being produced. And they're affecting, okay. And then you have all this, uh, the liver also part secreting some things. And then the liver, the duodenum, stomach also secretes as you know. Uh, pancreas, all this kidney all secrete plus of course the glands, uh, adrenal glands above the kidney. Adrenal is here, the kidney is here. All these that are mentioned here secrete chemicals. Chemicals are produced by these organs. And uh, then of course you get all the uh, other uh, uh, testosterone and all the other other uh, glances and all these are produced the ovaries etc now as I, we can close this up as we look at that then I realize okay if if all this meditation had to do with the health system then my mind goes to Chinese medicine of course it would include any herbal system whether Indians or whether it be Germans or, or all those things how they see the fact so we go to the Chinese uh, Chinese world of medicine. In the Chinese world of medicine, it's the philosophy of yin and yang. Yeah, yin and yang, uh, male and female forces. And uh, so, they have what you call uh, the zhang fu. I don't know how to pronounce. My like Chinese is very poor. So they, I think that zhang fu. Is that how you pronounce it? Okay, but I never heard of that term. I cannot write the Chinese word, but it's uh, romanized as zhang fu. Okay, whatever it was. It's a term used to describe various yin and yang organs. A yin organ is zhang, while a yang organ is fu. So you got zhang fu, whatever it was. And uh, so the, the organs are supposed to be balancing. You know, some are zhang organs, some are fu organs. So you got zhang fu, the yin and yang. The Chinese system of yin and yang is to balance. There are 12 organs of Chinese medicine. And in the Chinese medicine, Remember, Chinese medicine is trying to look for physical health. So the spiritual dimension might not be so emphasized. We look further down. And, uh, and there are six solid yin organs. Uh, zhang is made of six solid organs. Uh, heart, pericardium, lung, spleen, liver, kidney. So when they give you Chinese medicine, they're thinking of the third affecting your liver, your organ, your heart, to produce chemicals. And... Uh, 
then the foo consists of hollow organs and a small intestine, triple warmer organ function, which not all organs have a hollow tube going through them, stomach, large intestine, gallbladder, urine bladder, so the full side, there is then a Chinese system, that they try to balance yang and yin, and uh, we go further down in the Chinese medicine, then the Chinese medicine got the 12 meridians, uh, in addition to qi, traditional meridian a subtle energy system, by which qi uh, is circulated through the body through the 12 meridians, and in the 12 meridians that circulated, uh, they try to use acupuncture to basically uh, like water flowing, the energy must flow and not get stuck. And this is the Chinese philosophy which ends up with acupuncture, which is based on that philosophy. And you could look at qi system as a, uh, you know, many facts sometimes in let's say electrical circuits, whatever. So we go, we go lower down. And uh, then you got the five elements of the Chinese medicine, which is uh, 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 fire, wood, earth, metal, and water, etc. So Chinese try the medicine. Wood feeds fire, fire has ashes from earth, earth has metal, heat, liquefy, produce water vapor, water vapor, uh, nourishes, become wood again, so it goes circle round and round. And uh, so it goes to all those things, uh, the five elements, and then the last part, after the elements, the vital substance. Chinese have this. They have the qi, uh, qi, the body fluids, the blood, and the essence. They have to observe and balance that. So the qi is supposed to be the vital energy that gives us our capacity to move, think, feel. It protects you from illness, warms the body. Qi is derived from two main sources, the air we breathe, the food we eat. That's why they give the Chinese medicine. And then part of qi sometimes is the breathing, breathing technique. So you notice in Chinese medicine, they try to help your chi by the food or by the breathing technique. I remember when I was small, my father used to you know, do the chi and they go really go, breathe out. You know? And uh, he don't know where he learned it from. He was talking, talking about some chi kind of that time. I don't believe, I don't know what system was. But my chi. Also movement and breathing system. So air and food. So, when the supply of qi to the body is depleted or blocked, organ function is adversely affected by the inability to transform and transport the energy necessary to fight illness and disease. So that's the Chinese belief system. Then there's a body fluid, not so well known, but it's called jing yi, or whatever that was. And uh, I must have pronounced it wrong. So you look at me, what language is that? Okay. Uh, body fluids or jing, jing yi. <laughs> are the liquids which protect, nurture, and lubricate the body in conjunction with the blood. The moisture, nourishes, everything. Then there is blood, which is the material foundation for bone, nerve, skin, muscle. It also contains the shen, shen is spirit, uh, which balances the psyche. And uh, then you have jing, or the essence. So body is a reproductive, regenerative ability, regulates growth, etc. So these are uh, all the different substances. So by looking at it, and I realized that, okay, now I'm interested in this. I'm interested in how our thinking affect our health. And if you don't remember, I taught on the spiritual world, and I say that this kind came from Revelation. From God told me that your health and physical health is affected by three things. And you only mention three things. By what we believe, by what we feel, and by what we eat. So what we feel is as important, and, uh, and in the Chinese system, uh, your yin and yang, your feelings also can affect it. And so when I look at it and try to bring it back, and now we close this and we look at the comparative chart. Now we look at the comparative chart. And uh, so here's the chakra system. Here's the Chinese yin and yang section. And, and I look at the Chinese yin and yang and try to say, okay, as far as the Chinese is concerned, which part affect which part of the emotional or spirit part and uh, lungs, which is the air, and which part. Apparently, since it has to do with health and it's only in the uh, uh, food section, but when I look at it, I realize that, that even though the word blood or shen or spirit or is under spirit, I put it under soul, because in the Bible, the life is in the blood. And the blood is more to do with the soul. 
then the spirit and uh, each person's blood and uh, so I put it in this section under the soul and uh, then heart remains the same and chi although it's like an energy force I leave it here because it's like in the air it's something like an energy wave force that's energy and uh, then you have uh, all the other parts of the being and then I found I found actually when I fill out the blanks I had one empty spot there was no Chinese area for imagination <laughs> there was nothing you know it's not like your mother says you know oh you need more imagination eat more eat ginseng or whatever no there was none and then I realized that Chinese medicine began thousands of years ago with yin and yang but somewhere along the line that missing place was filled by another philosopher and uh, Tao was the guy who started it and if you know the symbol for Tao it's like the symbol of yin and yang with the rectangle uh, funny shape thing around it like a balance and when I read about Tao and its roots I realized that Tao sits on the top of the yin yang philosophy that uh, it, although the word Tao means like a, 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 a way uh, it was like a movement or things that are in the unknown realm that are trying to express itself and so out of the Chinese philosophy I pulled a Tao here to place it to complete the whole yin yang cycle uh, where it begins to relate correctly now for the chakra it was much simpler and uh, uh, some of it are obvious how it impacts different areas solar plexus, the heart, the you know, brow, the imagination, the throat and different parts of, uh, of, the, of the chakra that was easier to relate and uh, so when I relate to all this here is where we are, we are coming to this fact how, the question is how do we tap on the subconscious how does it impact us from the Bible perspective that uh, for me, I go by what the Lord revealed. He tells me that uh, 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 as far as our health is concerned, to be a healthy person, you must always watch what you eat, that's correct. You must always watch what you feel. So you can watch what you eat and you feel horrible, you also die early. You don't, have a, you, you don't live long. Some people don't watch what they eat 100%, but they watch 100% how they feel, and they still live long. And uh, so what you eat, what you feel, and what you believe. Remember how I mentioned your belief system will affect your life. And will affect how your life flow because life is not just your life. Your life in harmony with all that is around you. All of the planet, all of the world system, and all the invisible and visible world that we have around us function on truth. Because they are not like men that can be deceived they function with their law all the time so when we as a human being with free choice function according to the universal law there is a completeness of harmony I can say this fact you're in harmony with the universe wow what a big word the harmony with the universe uh, that implies you can be this, in this harmony with the universe it's something in your life just, just it's just like a sore thumb in the whole universe the whole universe like a human body you're sore thumb and in disharmony probably the planet earth is in disharmony with the universe in general but uh, there is a sense and we know that not all the planet earth is in harmony with Jesus Christ anything Jesus says I am the way the truth and the light John 14 verse 6 so to be in harmony with Jesus is to be in harmony with the whole universe that he created and the whole world and whole being world universe that he created uh, as it operates and flow through this human cycle the human number is actually six and not seven see when you take out the spirit you have just six six human creation was based on six a system of six and you add the spirit to make it a seventh uh, completion of revelation and a human system is spirit soul and body but the body is complex and the soul is complex so we got all these other systems to go with it together that as we understand 
the mind of Christ and the law of the mind, here is what we bring forth to you. There are certain thoughts, I believe, that can affect different parts of us. For example, when you sing certain songs, let's say, you know, you sing a worthy song. Let's say a worthy song that I one time I heard Eddie mimicking. Not that he sing, he doesn't sing worthy song. And Eddie would say, feeling, nothing but feeling. Okay, it's a real, feel, real emotional song. Okay, so if you sing it long enough, what will it make you? A feeling soul person. Correct. So apparently, you're affected by the songs you sing, and the songs you sing affect you by free choice. Or uh, sometimes food affects us. It has slowly come to uh, be understood that when an animal is fed a lot of blood and, and if, if human beings eat a lot of meat, if you're a real meat eater, uh, instead of being herbivorous, you're actually carnivorous, as close to the tiger and lion as you possibly can. And then you tend to have very strong animal appetites. It seems to strengthen them in you. There's a little bit of research done, not much yet. So apparently, what you choose to eat is also affecting your being, your state of being. For that reason, haven't you noticed that even in the secular world and in the other religions, when they try to get more spiritual, they avoid meats, they go to vegetarian, or they go to a fast. And in, uh, in some religions when they wanted some they wanted to become a medium or some spirit to possess them some of them had to fast for a while and avoid eating meats in order to get the right spirit to possess them and uh, notice that the food and diet affects your total being to a certain extent and it is true that there are certain sounds and there are certain words that can actually bring you to a higher spiritual plane. Let's say when you're singing in the spirit, it gives a different atmosphere, which is what the secular world doesn't have, when other religions don't have. So when you have... we have to look at it through foods and although in the New Testament they did away with food in the Old Testament they had to God told them what to eat what not to eat Daniel chose not to eat certain things it's only in the New Testament in Romans 14 that Paul says food neither brought us closer to God or didn't bring us closer to God only Paul said you know why they said that because in the New Testament, the Spirit has become so powerful that even food can be changed in its vibration, if you can call it. That is why Mark 16, verse 17 and 18 says, In my name, they shall cast out demons. They shall speak in new tongues. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall by no means hurt them. So only when the Holy Spirit came to a certain power, food become subdominant. But in the meantime, under the laws of health, it's important to balance your food to a certain extent. But it is interesting to note that the food, types of food, lack of it or quantity of food, let's say you try to be a spiritual person, but every day you must have eight meals a day. Each meal contains three Big Macs. So I turn around and say, let's try to be a spiritual person and eat eight meals a day. 
You might say, oh, praise the Lord, I can do that. Hallelujah. At the end, when you reach after five years, and you become about 400 kilos. <laughs> praise the Lord. You might also die with your last breath. <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> so, you might have a certain spiritual stature, but still something could be missing. So apparently, in where the where the spirit is not, there is a sort of critical factor where there is the spirit is not fully powerful to a certain extent. Food does affect you to a different extent. If you don't believe it, I, I would welcome you to test out these principles. Test out, uh, like Daniel, for example, test out three days of eating vegetables or fresh vegetables. And when, when the Lord revealed it to me, the Lord also showed there's a difference between eating uncooked and cooked foods. By uncooked, I mean raw fruits, raw vegetables. <laughs> different. Because some of you say, ah, yeah, okay, okay, try your eye for three days. <laughs> See if you come out more healthy, then you'll be grateful. But apparently, what we eat can actually tune your entire, you see, our whole body is just a vibration system, an energy system. And what we put inside us change our entire, uh, entire uh, 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 system. And uh, so food seems to play a role. So the Chinese have got it right to a certain extent. Hindus and Buddhism have got it right to a certain extent because concentration of your thought life and choosing what part of thoughts does affect you. The thoughts you think affect your glands. If, if you think angry thoughts, instead of being Peter Pan, you know, think happy thoughts, happy thoughts, and you can fly. You think angry thoughts, horrible thoughts, and you pull back from your memory the most painful thoughts, and you focus on it for three days and three nights, fourth day die. <laughs> It is possible that the thoughts we think do produce things in our life and affect us. And so that's something that we learn. Where do we learn this from? From understanding these Hebrew words and knowing that the mind and the soul are closely tied up together. The mind and the mouth are closely tied up together. Wow, that's something that we learn from the Hebrew word understanding. No wonder, then they say, if food is not so important, then I ask you a question, why did Jesus have to fast? When he confronted the devil, why did he have to fast? Couldn't Jesus have, have fought the devil with a full stomach? And then he could burp and the devil fly away. <laughs> he could have. But why did he choose to fast? Probably because he knew that part of tapping into the spirit involved rejecting and uh, putting the flesh down, which include fasting. So he seems to understand that principle. So food, thoughts, emotions. Emotions. And uh, from all this chart, we learn one thing. Emotions. Uh, where the heart is like the center of knowing and emotions, and here's your soul, your emotions, affect your spirit level. So that is why the Bible says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a grateful emotion. And into his courts, we praise. So what happens if you do the opposite? You try to enter his gates with complaining <laughs> and into his courts with blasphemy. Lo and behold, you found you enter wrong place. Hell. <laughs> this is a different place altogether. It seems that we create our heaven and on earth right now. You create your heaven and on earth, your food, your feelings, your thoughts. All these are tapping into the well-being of your life, your feelings. And uh, apparently we can choose what to feel. Now feelings are like thoughts. 
Some thoughts come to you, you didn't choose. You just walk outside to the supermarket, some thoughts catch you, some thoughts come to you by the newspapers, magazines, things people that some thoughts come to you. But some thoughts you choose. And even if some thoughts come to you, you still can choose to change your mind and look at other thoughts. Feelings are the same. Some feelings just come to you from the atmosphere or the people all around you. I mean, you go to the supermarket, everyone with a long papaya face. And everywhere you see a thousand papaya faces. So you go to the MRT, everyone long papaya. After some time, you also start imitating subconsciously. You know, your face also grow very long. And uh, so it subconsciously influences you or the music that is around, atmosphere that is around, and uh, there's invisible forces involved, and it affects you. You still can choose. You still can choose. But to choose and change it, we need a lot of energy, a lot of stamina. And uh, so I found that to understand how to change all those things, to change all those things, yes, uh, all these areas, the key, the most powerful key seems to be the spirit. And so within each one of us is an inner knowing. Is an inner knowing deep inside. Then there's a feeling knowing. You know how you feel. All these are inside you. There's a heart knowing that is there. Heart knowing. Then there's a visual knowing. And there's a physical knowing that is also there. And cognitive knowing and experiential knowing. All these different knowings, uh, they are there. Ah, my one is loose. Visual knowing, physical knowing, cognitive knowing, experiential knowing. Cognitive is what we all know. So, cognitive is uh, what we all have always experienced. So, this cognitive knowing is what we always have. And we thought that's the only knowing. So the next time before you make a decision, check your inner knowing, feeling knowing, heart knowing, and your sense of knowing, vision. So all this, when, when everything check, 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 you know that before the plane takes off, before the rocket takes off, check, 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 and everything check, ah, all is safe. And some of us say, I'm wasting time. Oh yeah, wait till you're on the plane. And then the pilot says, check, 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 check. Oh, you don't need to check. All oh, the plane crash. Sometimes our life crash because we did not check all the knowing. We rely on only one knowing. Isn't it terrible? Now that you look at the whole picture of the mind, you realize if we just rely on one knowing, you might get it right once in a while. And ignore all the other knowing. See, when David cut off Saul's coat, something, some knowing hit him. Another part of him hit him. Which part? His heart knowing. It says, David's heart slapped him. <coughs> the word smoke is slapped. So some inner man we hang him, give David a slap. As David cut off Saul's coat, his heart smote him. S M O T E. David said, Oh, did who hit me? Did you? Did you? Did you? Did you? No. It was an internal one. He got a slap on the inside. Then he knew, oh, I cannot, I should not be doing this. And that's why he he corrected himself. So sometimes David. You know, so the question I ask you, if you cannot feel the positive, can you feel the negative? Have your heart slapped you before? Or your inner man protested? Or your inner knowing? So then we realize that as we look at this whole thing, we sometimes have ignored the inner man, the hidden man of the heart. These are all the Bible, Bible telling us about our spirit man within us. New man, hidden man, inner man, these are the real men. The one that we always follow wrongly is old man. And the old man is supposed to be crucified. The Bible says, put on the old man. Instead, we put on the old man and try to brush your face, make you look new a bit. And we see the old man, old man functioning. Your old man crucified on the cross, but still alive. All this crucified, still alive. 
but at least it's supposed to be an observer. So you tell your old man, you stay on the cross, just observe. Let the new man, the hidden man, and the inner man take over in your life. And then your life will be much so different. Let's all choose to follow the inner man, the new man, the hidden man of the heart. And your lives will take a different route. From now forwards, until the day we meet Jesus face to face, let's make that decision that we will allow our inner man, our hidden man, and our new man inside us take over our lives. It was supposed to be this way, but we were not taught. We could not differentiate between old man, new man, hidden man, all those things. But as we become aware of it, and we yield to God, we will be better in health, better in prosperity, better spiritually. And there will be, I didn't say there will be valleys. There will be valleys, but you will find a way out. There may be mountains that block you, you find a way over. There will be difficult situations, but your inner man will never panic. There will always be the inner peace and joy that is there to cushion you, to guide you. Praise God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we ask, so Lord, that you teach us and guide us by your Spirit. And we know, Lord, your Spirit guides us by the inner man of the heart, by the hidden man of the heart, by the inward man within us. We ask, so God, that you will help us to be sensitive to the presence of the Spirit inside us. That we will be sensitive to Christ who lives within us. So that we could be transformed and changed, Lord, by the Spirit that is within us. Thank you, Father. Seal these truths in our life. In Jesus' name. Amen.